I'm gonna say a million words. So I'm ready. I'm gonna get get into it. Uh <laughs> Uh, so when talking about haunted towns, it's hard to pinpoint just one as a concept of a haunted location is totally subjective to a specific experience, uh, as well as a collective experience. Most of America is haunted by its history. And with that logic, all towns are haunted here. Um, there are endless horrible things that have taken place here that would create the necessary energy and impact that would give cause to haunting. However, this film specifically highlights Detroit, so for my section, I'll go into greater detail about some of the things shown in the film, as well as the many reasons Detroit is, like, deeply haunted. Um, so, Detroit, Michigan. Um, what is haunting Detroit specifically? Um, hints at this are highlighted throughout the film. Gabe got into it a lot in their section of two, um, although... It's like the staging ground for the plot that's taking place, not exactly mm -hmm. like the forefront of the story, although it is still very important. It's like something that's highlighted throughout the film, but we don't get to unpack it, I guess, at the level that I'm going to now. Mm -hmm. um, so as Gabe mentioned, in one of the flashbacks of the film, we hear a neighbor approach the villain villain and say they are leaving because the neighbor is going to hell. And this is a nod to the extensive segregation and white flight uh, that has existed in Detroit, uh, specifically in response to fears around desegregation, as well as uh, just racism. Um, there is also a deeply upsetting history surrounding uh, racially motivated police brutality, uh, and that'll be the bulk of what I cover in this. So that is also just like a content warning for folks if they do not want to hear about that right now, they're not in the headspace for that. Uh, just so you know, that's what we'll be covering today. All of this information is meant to provide further context for the landscape we witness in the film, as well as explain why we chose to highlight this film in our Haunted Town series. Um, while Detroit may not be haunted by a monster in the theatrical sense, it is very haunted by its history, and the impact of that history haunts and hurts people to this day. Um, as I said, a content warning uh, for police brutality, murder, racism, and segregation. Um, if you, I'm going to highlight a source specifically that if you do not want to hear me talk about this or see my face talk about this and you want to just learn about it still, um, I am linking a very helpful resource, which I'm going to explain, um, which is the Detroit Under Fire Police Violence, Crime, Politics, and Struggle for Radical racial justice in the civil rights era and more. It's specifically um, a multimedia digital exhibit that documents patterns and incidents of police brutality and misconduct, as well as the fatal shootings and other killings by law enforcement in the city of Detroit during the era of the modern civil rights movement from 1957 to 1973. The exhibit further chronicles the anti-police brutality struggle waged by civil rights and the black power groups and many ordinary people who demanded racial and social justice and sought accountability for systemic police violence. The main goal of Detroit Under Fire is to uncover the deliberately hidden history of police violence, building upon the work of activists at the time that these events happened and to make this history available to impact communities, students and broader public audiences. The Detroit Under Fire research team has identified 75% of the officially acknowledged total of fatal shootings by police officers and excavated more than 400 other brutality and misconduct conduct complaints by Black citizens from the depths of the archives. These stories are told, many for the first time publicly, in more than 100 exhibit pages that reproduce around 1,500 archival documents and allow audiences to examine these sources for themselves and dig deeper into history. So this source filled the bulk of my section. There was just so much information that I didn't even get to read all of it. It was just very interesting um, and upsetting. And But it's definitely one of those things I highly recommend if this is some, a topic that you want to learn more about um, and you want to know about things that have been kind of like swept under the rug, specifically with intention, uh, you can read about them. Um, it was published in March 2021, and it was a pilot project for the Policing and Social Justice History Lab, uh, an, an affiliate of the Carceral State Project at the University of Michigan. Um, so with that being said, uh, there is no way I can cover the entirety of this in the time allotted, so I recommend reading through the historical documentation at your leisure if you wish to. Um, Detroit specifically has a long and complex history with racism, and a turning point in that history 
that ended up unfortunately being more performative than anything else was the political career of Mayor Jerome Cavanaugh. Um, Jerome Cavanaugh ran as an antithesis of the Republican incumbent, Louis Miriani. He was a young liberal Democrat, a supporter of civil rights reforms, and he advocated for a better police and community relations. African Americans and white liberal voters rallied around his campaign. For many commentators, Kavanaugh seemed to be Detroit's version of President John F. Kennedy, a youthful Catholic politician, a father of six, an energetic reformer. Kavanaugh ran on the platform of change, promising more jobs and a return of Detroit of to be a great city it had once been. Um, the reason I like, well, they kind of start with this in the article, but it also just seems like a very important turning point when uh, you get this like hope that mm -hmm. things might start to turn around because the time that this is positioned in is like 1963. Uh, so just to give you a context of the climate then, uh, his optimism ultimately ended up taking precedence over reality. He did a lot of talking but ultimately landed more moderately than needed when it came to civil rights legislation, especially proving that his own biases made him incapable of taking the necessary steps towards non-performative action. Kavanaugh, once in office, appointed George Edwards to be the new commissioner of the Detroit Police Department with the goal of achieving achieving like light reform, like diet reform. <laughs> um, the reform was packaged as equal enforcement of the law, uh, but really it was just a more firm reminder that the police should be followed. Like their whole thing was like, there was a code of conduct made in like the fifties. And they're like, this is just a nice reminder that you should have been following that the entire time. Mm -hmm. That's, that was their reform. They were like, <laughs> hey, hey remember you have a handbook, read it and do what it says. That was all they did. They didn't actually reform anything. Mm. They just said that they were mad that they weren't listening to their handbook. That's mm. all that happened. Um, neither Kavanaugh nor Edwards supported the necessary reform to punish and investigate officers on claims of poli police brutality, however. And the results of their entire campaign and masked reform was uh, I don't see color and just stop being racist as a platform um, that did very little to actually dismantle any forms of systemic oppression. Mm -hmm. um, and the systemic issues in Detroit included, but were not limited to, the job and housing discrimination, redlining, racial and economic segregation, and extensive police brutality, a deep wound that cannot be healed with euphemistic words and a vague list of empty promises. Uh, a year into his term, reality came crashing in and the wound was now infected. So he kind of positioned himself as this like optimistic, wonderful person mm -hmm. and not paying attention to reality. And then reality was like, hey, but actually mm -hmm. you're full of crap. Um, so apparently uh, Martin Luther King Jr. marched through Detroit, Michigan in 1963. This was the same year he was elect uh, that Kavanaugh was elected on the Walk for Freedom. Uh, he gave a speech very similar to the I Have a Dream speech and everything went well. Uh, the Detroit police were claimed to show restraint and act nonviolently towards protesters, hmm. which is the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were complimented extensively for this. And that was where, like, the chaos starts to ensue. Um, they were <laughs> endlessly complimented just for not being violent towards protesters. Uh, the problematic of that is like obvious in many ways, but especially with the traumatic history of police brutality that had been extensively documented and lived for many black Americans living in Detroit from like nine, for the entire time that they were living there, but specifically the period of 1950 to 1963, right before Kavanaugh was elected. Mm -hmm. um, while King and other civil rights pro Rights leaders praised the Detroit Police Department for its professionalism during the Walk of Freedom, and the city's white leadership and media lavishly praised themselves. On June 24th, the day after the march, Police Commissioner Edwards stated, I have been receiving congratulations on the work of the police department from all walks of life in the city of Detroit. Edwards also told his officers it was a tremendous tribute to the work of the police department of this community and every single officer who was on duty that day. I suggest to you that the discipline, the skill, the strength with which all details handled the problems of the parade and meeting of constitu meeting constituted a higher watermark of professionalism. The Detroit Free Press and the Detroit News also wrote multiple articles about this. 
how superbly the police operated to maintain public safety, to prevent violence, and to refrain from using force against the demonstrators. With that being said, the march was orderly and nonviolent, so it was not clear why police restraint from deploying violence is particularly notable, except as a contrast to the open and unapologetic racism of the Birmingham police. It was very much like the North in how they're quietly racist uh, mm-hmm. and lauding that over the blatant racism of the South. They were just mm-hmm. like, look at you not be violent towards people. We're the good ones. Yeah, it was very that. And they were just like, really just, there were just so many articles outlining like, look at them, so good. Love yeah. that they didn't vi- like conduct violence against innocent people. Yeah. Great job, police. Uh, <laughs> So following this loud display of the Detroit government parading, look how not racist we are, many Black Detroit residents continued to feel frustrated with the false presentation of the police and the Detroit government that was very different from their lived experience, Um, as well as very, as well as very different from the documented evidence to the contrary. Uh, The Detroit police at the time already had a long history of conducting illegal arrests on Black residents, and the city itself was and currently is deeply segregated. According to the Detroit chapter, of the NAACP in the Detroit branch of the ACLU, uh, the Detroit Police Department consistently and disproportionately subjected African Americans to illegal investigative arrests where officers arrested allegedly suspicious people and detained them during crime investigations. In the 1958 report, Arrests Without Warrant, by Harold Norris of the Detroit branch of the ACLU, documented this unjust and extensive system of investigative arrests. The report published by the NAACP magazine, The Crisis, revealed that more than one third of all non-traffic arrests made by the DPD were warrantless arrests for investigation only. The State Bar of Michigan had condemned the DT. DPD practice of making investigative arrests without probable cause as far back as 1948. As as of 1956, 26,696 out of 67,301 total non-traffic arrests were warrantless, Mm -hmm. and most did not meet the legal standard of probable cause. The ratio had been similar for the previous decade. Norris concluded thousands of citizens spend thousands of days in jail illegally and with little opportunity for release. Other thousands of citizens are forced by the same practice to pay out thousands of dollars in bond money Mm -hmm. as a kind of ransom to regain the freedom of which they had been wrongfully deprived. Um, This is from Harold Norris in the crisis. The DPD's illegal policy to investigate of investigative arrests primarily targeted African-Americans, Norris categorized their experiences as the equivalent of living in a police state, not a democracy, mm-hmm. where the criminal justice system deprived them of a constitu- constitutional right to fundamental immunity or arbitrary arrest. He also criticized the local courts for not enforcing the writ of habeas corpus and allowing DPD officers to detain arrested people indefinitely. Mm-mm. Finally, the ACLU report stated that DPD officers often tortured and abused these wrongfully held prisoners in order to coerce confessions and solve crimes. Disgusting. Um, so okay. this is literally, okay. This man was elected in 1963. Mm-hmm. This report was about 1958. Literally a handful of years have taken place Mm -hmm. since that article was published. There was no even insinuation that things had gotten better since then. So the fact that they had just like praised this obviously corrupt police department to the level that they did reasonably made people mad. (laughs) so uh these events are what necessitated the change in police commissioners and mayors in the first place but ultimately little changed this became even more obvious with the blatant soon after the blatant uh racism that took place soon after the march um edwards took a three-week vacay to europe in celebration of the good press of course and while gone something very awful happened Mm -hmm. uh Very soon after the events of the Walk for Freedom and very close to the route of the walk, like literally it is, they show like the line in the the article. um, And it's like literally the line of where he, Martin Luther King walked and then right next to it, like literally right here Mm -hmm. where uh, this event took place. So uh, essentially 
a Detroit officer murdered an unarmed black woman named Cynthia Scott. And while that is already horrific and awful, they go to the extreme lengths to cover up the murder. Um, the mayor and the police attempted to cover up the murder in order to maintain their image. They didn't want to lose the momentum that they gained in their good press. Mm -hmm. uh, a week following the murder, the country county prosecutor ruled the shooting a justifiable homicide. And in response, 2,500 Amer African Americans joined and demonstrated at the DPD's downtown headquarters to protest police violence. The campaign for justice for Cynthia Scott was led by the Detroit Council for Human Rights, a newer militant counterpart to the NDL NAACP by churches with the Black Nationalist Orientation, especially Reverend Albert Cleveland Shrine and the Black Madonna, by radical young Black activists and recently formed groups called Goal and UHRU. U-H-U-R-U, -U, and by regular working class Black people, especially women. Um, some of the documentation proving that they covered this murder up did not get released until 2020. Um, specifically, the statements from the officers that clearly were altered and fabricated. So if you want to know more about that specific case, they go over it extensively. Um, there's an entire section of the website outlining the corruption of that specific incident. Unsurprisingly, the media supported the officer's framing of the event and defamed Cynthia Scott in the press as well, skewing the public opinion of the case. Um, so I provide links to that if you wish to read more about what that is. And also just like, so you know, it actually happened uh, because mm -hmm. they went to extensive lengths to cover it up and make it seem that, like it wasn't real and like to devalue her life. Similarly to how we saw in the film that the police mm -hmm. very much did not care about the people that mm -hmm. they were tasked with serving. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, just a year after and another instance of police brutality, a young woman named Barbara Jackson was brutally attacked by D Detroit police. Luckily, she survived the encounter and sued the Detroit Police Department for discrimination by race, therefore violating her civil and constitutional rights and won, which was great. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, even though the verdict was a win, uh, in 1965, the Jackson verdict, along with two others involving black citizens from Detroit announced simultaneously represented the first completed police brutality investigation by a new agency. However, this did not result in tangible change and the officers only received reprimands and were transferred to a different precinct. Um, this failure to punish violent and criminal police officers had tragic consequences, not least because patrolman Raymond Peterson went on to compile a long track record of brutality against other black citizens and ultimately participated in the killings of nine African-American males, mm. included one, including one that led to the prosecution for murder during the DPD's undercover stress operation from 1971 to 1973. Um, so essentially... And that was a guy who just got transferred instead of yes yeah so he got no consequences and eventually did get prosecuted for murder mm -hmm. murdered black but those people. murders could have been presented they prevented. could have been prevented if he just had consequences in the first place and was held yeah. accountable for his action 100 percent um so and also they mentioned the stress operation which they get into pretty extensively it was really just like undercover police violence uh that was created to prevent crime by attacking people that they suspected of crime, which was just total racism. Mm -hmm. um, and they did disarm and decontinue stress, but it took many, many, many years to get that. Mm -hmm. um, they did a lot of damage, but uh, I don't think I'm going to get too into stress specifically. So that's why I wanted to highlight in case you did want to learn about it more. Um, nationally, the war on poverty and crime further funded and militarized the police to terrorize communities by tasking them with monitoring things they should have never been in charge of. Um, that being said, the target of the war on crime was not merely criminal behavior, but rather the sociological and economic factors that the national government believed led to criminality. To that end, police and other law enforcement officials were responsible for monitoring poverty, racial antagonism, family breakdown, and restlessness of young people, according to President Johnson's Commission of Law Enforcement and the Administration of Justice. By tasking law enforcement officers to solve community-based issues, Johnson established a national war on crime as a guerrilla warfare style attack in poor urban Black neighborhoods. Flooding the streets with police, often in plain clothes, was the presumptive solution to the Americans' crime crisis. The policy led to racial criminalization of Black youth on the street, often for minor offenses or for nothing at all, and was 
not effective in combating actual criminal behavior. In Detroit, despite a rampant influx of officers in the Black community, violent and nonviolent crime rates remain relatively unchanged during the mid-1960s. Um, the most Gotham and Batman-like method that was so close to the point but chose the entirely wrong solution. Mm -hmm. They recognized that poverty has an impact on people. And instead of funding public programs to uplift those communities, he was like, let's just punch them. Mm -hmm. Let's just murder them and punch them and that'll Justice. fix it. Like... <laughs> It's just so it's like they they were so close to the point and then just mm -hmm. were like right off it's yeah. just so dumb it really just if they just had any sense they could have just not murdered all these people so uh but they did not do that because racism and if you've been watching the news at all they still aren't um as expected when you terrorize communities there will be uprisings against that terror there will be like reactions to the unjust things happening so the detroit uprising of 1967 was a violent and divisive time for the city and part of a wave of urban unrest that spread across the nation in the mid to late 1960s incidents of police brutality and harassment of african americans were the immediate triggers for almost every episode of civil unrest during this era in detroit the specific tri trigger was a police raid of the blind pig and after hours bar in the early morning of july 23rd 1967 Officers in the Detroit Police Department arrested 85 African Americans, and this time people fought back. The civil disorder, alter alternatively labeled a riot, a rebellion, and an uprising, lasted for nine days and resulted in at least 43 deaths. The mm -hmm. official count is 33 African Americans and 10 white people. Uh, around 72,000 arrests and significant property damage was a result. The governor of Michigan declared a state of emergency and mobilized the National Guard, and the President of the United States eventually sent in the U.S. Army paratroopers to occupy the city of Detroit. So, uh, 7,200. 7,200. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I am bad at numbers. No, it's totally cool. I, I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah 7,200. So sorry. I always mess up what the zeros mean. Um, it's okay. Luckily, it was on the screen. So, mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, the response to, again, they're so close. Like, they were just like, let's just make more police brutality. That'll fix mm -hmm. it. Uh, and they didn't, obviously. They're mad about police brutality. So, let's we do more do of it. Do more of it. Uh, and clearly, if you witnessed 2020, They've learned nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when asked why they were upset about what was happening, why the riot even took place, uh, the causes were pretty, you would think, obvious. Riot causes identified by Black residents of Detroit in Urban League survey stated that while systematic police brutality and mistreatment of Detroit's African-American residents served as a catalyst, the 1967 uprise also was the culmination of many underlying forces, including deep patterns of racial segregation and discrimination in housing, education, and employment. The typical rioter, rioter was an unemployed African-American male between 15 and 24 years old, and in the aftermath, the investigation seeking to pinpoint the cause of the civil unrest blamed white racism, housing segregation, black male unemployment, and especially widespread African-American resentment against police brutality. The story of African-Americans in Detroit revealed a similar indictment, uh, indictment. indictment word. Mm -hmm. A survey of African-Americans in Detroit revealed a similar in indictment. Police brutality was the number one cause of the civil disturbance, followed closely by crowded and substandard housing, unemployment, and poverty. So they specifically list overcrowded living conditions, poor housing, lack of jobs, poverty, and at the top of the list, police brutality. Um, the uprising of July 1967 shattered the previous false reputation that Detroit had as modeled as a city for racial progress. All that, mm. you know, in 1963, this guy's been mayor for all this time. Um, all that false euphemistic, press that was like mm -hmm. how great we are was finally nationally shattered uh mm -hmm. everyone kind of actually knew what was going on now uh it showed the whole world the very present tension that was caused by decades of racial discrimination and police violence despite all the evidence to the contrary the detroit police department learned nothing 
they thought they were doing a great job. Uh, Mm -hmm. They denied police brutality ever existed only as a hoax to campaign against law enforcement, if that sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, So essentially the thoughts from 1963 to present or 1967 to present have been pretty consistent. Mayor Kavanaugh doubled down in his performative progressiveness, claiming police brutality was a thing of the past and signed a repressive and racially targeted stop and frisk law demanded by Detroit's white population on an indication of full alignment of white liberalism with police repression in the aftermath of the nationwide wave of urban uprisings. In addition, he enacted a hotline where citizens could call the police on things they thought might be crimes, which largely empowered white populations to militarize militarize the police against black Detroit residents. Uh, The black Birth of the Karens. Yeah. Uh, The black community even lists rumors initiated by white residents as the cause for police brutality in the surveys that were mentioned above. Uh, So the decision was especially tone deaf. Uh, The rumor control center received more than 10,000 calls in the first two months of operation in the spring of 1968. And the volume skyrocketed after fears of another riot uprising intensified following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. In a typical pattern, civil rights protests such as the Black student school walkouts would prompt a flood of calls from fearful white residents and then the ensuing police crackdowns, which generally included serious brutality, would elicit alarmed calls from Black residents who heard rumors that the police were shooting African-American youth. Mm. When you thought it could not get worse, it continues to do so. Uh, So as time continued, the expansion of militarized, racially targeted law enforcement in Detroit, specifically during the early 1970s, took shape in the context of the punitive federal laws on crime and drugs during the Nixon administration. All of these things furthered the divide and fear from white residents, empowering them to weaponize that fear. Uh, This fear is what led to the Detroit to Detroit, like one, I'm I'm not even talking about Reagan and all the damage that he did, but like this Mm -hmm. led to it remaining one of the most segregated cities in the United States to this day. Uh, In another article titled Residential Segregation in Detroit by Allison Muano, Zoe Wallen, and Kate Satejikate, they highlight how all these things coincided with segregation, financial inequity, and racism. Today, Detroit is the second most segregated city in the United States. More than half, 52.4% of Black residents of the greater Detroit area reside in primarily Black neighborhoods, well above the national average of 16.8%. And tensions persist over issues of segregation. To this point, primarily white suburban areas vetoed plans for a regional transit system in the metropolitan Detroit area, preventing increased integration. And white enrollment in schools with an influx of black students has dropped tremendously. Funding inequities between historically white and black communities also contribute to the lack of resources available to black and low-income communities and thereby continue the legacy of segregation in those areas. Um, Obviously, of course, there is more information on the time between 1970s and today. Um, As Gabe kind of touched on what's happening now in terms of the housing issues, as well as Mm -hmm. like the reality of like what Reagan did to this country and the black community uh, that I didn't even get into. There's just so much history there. But uh, essentially, the reason I focused on the time that I did uh, was to really kind of show you how we got here, because I feel like. I don't know, in being that I was born in the 90s, I like felt like I knew more about the Reagan era in America, mm-hmm. but I didn't know specifically about like the 60s other than like the stuff that they teach you in school about like civil rights. Um, yeah. I did not know anything specifically about Detroit. And a lot of it ended up like aligning to make sense of why the world is how it is right now. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that there were, like, clear indicators of, like, what motivated, like, white fear to empower, like, militarize police against Black communities. Uh, Mm -hmm. That stood out a lot. Um, So, at the end of the day, this information above will hopefully provide some additional context to why Detroit specifically is very haunted. and And what paved the way for the realities it faces today, as well as the landscape we're given in the film of decimated neighborhoods with many abandoned homes and crumbling infrastructure. Uh, and you can read about those issues in some links that I link in our blog, specifically Detroit overtaxed homeowners 
600 million years later, advocates still seeking reparations. Um, Detroit home repair crisis is even bigger than experts thought. Detroit, the evolution of the housing crisis. A lot has been happening specifically with housing in Detroit for a while now, as Gabe said, motivated in some part because of the auto industry and its destruction uh, or like closing of factories, layoffs, et cetera, as well as just like the very long seated history of like segregation and racism that has been prevalent there for a very long time. Um, so it's just context. Mm -hmm. It's just an unfortunate context. Yeah. And I mean, we've talked about redlining and gentrification and how that impacts communities. And so that's like the direct reaction to that. Like that's the link from those events and how it frames this very volatile and harmful like force on a community. And now like it, it's like their segregation is very intentional. It is to keep those people over there keep us over here. All the funding comes over here. All the harm goes over there. Like very specific, very yeah. intentional. And that's how you end up with a town like Brightmore and you end up with the horror stories like Barbarian. Not exactly, obviously, but like yeah. the, 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 the horrors that were like people might miss mm -hmm. the first time watching through. Yeah, 100%. And just like, also just... <laughs> It's honestly just like insane how well documented all this is in addition, like that, like there's just such a clear line mm -hmm. of how and like how intentionality around hiding that information has been like in making sure that people don't know that information uh, so that they're like, how, what do you mean? How did we get here? It's mm -hmm. been so long where it's like in everything that I read, there was just such a clear line. To like yeah all the social factors of how like fear specifically influenced just so many of the wrong decisions and how all those decisions stacked and all of them involved violence and like it's just so like obvious when you look at it all I mm -hmm. guess yeah and I wonder like if there's a site like this about Philly too, because there's a lot of history with our mayors and police force. I mean, some people just learning about like the move bombing, mm -hmm. like they had like a special about it that my mom learned about and called me because she was like, what? Like no one talks about those things. And that was even more recent. So you're thinking yeah. like, I wonder if there is I bet that there Somewhere. is, yeah. I mean, because it's like lots of things are viewed on a national spectrum instead of like a uh, state or city-based. Like mm -hmm. you get really siloed into a specific area. I feel like you really can see the exact ways it does impact people. Um, because on a national level, it's like it's all happening, yes, but like you're not getting the actual like faces as much. You know, you're not getting mm -hmm. the actual like po specific policies that influence neighborhoods um and everything else like you get everything on a very national level like what federally was happening um mm -hmm. what was being like pushed to do from overhead and like this is like a very interesting like opposite view where you're looking so much at what like this specific city is doing um, mm -hmm. and how that is influenced by the stuff happening overhead but how mm -hmm. they're very much creating this situation and making it worse actively through every decision that they make it was very interesting devastating yeah uh, yeah but very interesting yeah so. and I feel like you know we've covered like we're gonna have another episode on haunted towns next week and it'll be a little different um but yeah more about factory towns and yeah, which is like kind of, I mean, kind of what Detroit was too. Like it was the automotive industry and it was booming when it was booming and then nobody wanted cars. And now yeah, there's lots of towns in Pennsylvania too that uh, have a similar mm -hmm. story in terms of the infrastructure and like mining and other kinds of the transition of factory towns and how mm -hmm. we are now. Yeah, I feel like that's a really big Northeast thing. Like, mm -hmm. I know, like, in Massachusetts, like, my family has a lot of history with factories and how once you're at, like, once those aren't used anymore, you know, we could, like, entire populations were yeah. just that's totally. There shouldn't be an Amazon town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If, if if this will teach you, there's a little bit of that as well. Uh, mm hmm 
or just watch Sorry to Bother You. Yeah, also, <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> yeah. And like, um, I think even our episode about like the sunken homes, the sunken haunted mm-hmm. homes was also haunted towns. Like, I yeah. think this, specifically this series has really showed like haunting in a different way that I think people aren't always actively thinking about, yeah. you know, like our grief episode. But I think specifically for me it's been very eye-opening to think of the many ways that like entire communities and places are haunted by the decisions and the oppressive forces of the people who inhabit those spaces yeah it's It's, pretty spooky it's definitely very scary 100 it's like scary in the reality way Mm -hmm. Uh, that it's not like this like theatrical monster uh or like haunted house in the terms of like there's ghosts in there uh it's very real and stressful yeah and I think like (laughs) I think this episode like the film was really surprising to me Mm -hmm. like when because when I was watching it and it, it like dawned on me like seeing Detroit and seeing it that way I was like this is a haunted town. Like, the, and then I was like, it is a haunted town. And the, I know there's so much history there and there's so yeah. much pain there I too. Talk about the, like the white flight specifically and like that impact as well. Like there's so much, so much. Mm-hmm. It's insane. Uh, yeah. And it's just one place, one yeah. s- specific city in this entire country that's filled with a million other stories that are likely at least like parallel to what happened there so Mm -hmm. yeah it's like it's an epidemic in in the entire country for sure if history makes you happy you're not doing it right (laughs) yeah you're not reading the right history actually some (laughs) crt in here you know like (laughs) um yeah yeah well (laughs) Oh, the, hope that was educational for you. If you have any thoughts, like if you live in Detroit or if you know people who live in Detroit, if you visited Detroit and you have some history or things that you want to share with us, please let us know at the goals next door yeah. Um We're still learning. We still want to learn. If you watch Barbarian, is there something that you got out of it that we haven't covered yet? Because we might circle back around <laughs> and cover something else that was a part of it. Yeah. Um, if there are films about haunted towns or what you would think is considered a haunted town let us know we can check that out too yeah and also like at the end of the day if you found anything i said interesting or even if it like made you mad you're like that's not what happened that's i don't know everything we're just covering these topics so like i highly encourage you to look for stuff too you know like mm-hmm. the stuff i put links or whatever but uh if you know you have different links and you're like hey cat you actually said something incorrect send me link the the correct thing and i'll be like heck yeah 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 definitely share your resources we'll share ours and um yeah we're always learning and growing and again this it's not our city it's not a time period we existed in and yeah. so we can only know what we're reading about and being told yeah so use that logic yourself too and how you analyze things mm-hmm. be like look at that i may not know everything because we don't <laughs> yeah it's one episode you got one hour of learning <laughs> about Detroit's housing crisis uh and also history with racism and redlining and uh uh segregation and all and that also stuff. just like this movie <laughs> yeah also watch this movie yeah Please, please, please watch this movie. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment, a review. Love to hear from you. We have a few more haunted things, some very interesting things coming up for the series. And then, we'll, you know, we'll be saying sayonara to this year and hopping into the next one. So if you have any suggestions or things that you would like us to cover in the new year, maybe some themes, maybe a film that you were really loving these days, let us know. We want to hear from you. Yeah. We have some ideas, but we're always ready to switch it up. Honestly, I think half the time we make a plan and we're like, all right, well, that is a good plan. Uh, (laughs) Uh, No, yeah, something else. Yeah. Nice. Well, don't get married. Delete your kids. Bye. Bye.